Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of the Handyman Success Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm one of the co-hosts, Jason Call, founder of Handyman Marketing Pros. I'm with Alan Lee, founder of uh, the Handyman Journey Business Coaching and also Honestly Handyman Services in Sacramento area. Uh, our mission for the podcast is to teach and inspire uh, using the stories and experience of our guests. Um, and today we are super excited to have uh, Nick uh, out of Utah joining us today. Nick, thanks so much, man, for coming on. If you don't mind uh, giving us a little lay of the land, a little background on your your business. Yeah, so I I guess the question is how far back do you want me to go? <laughs> Where the heart leads you. <laughs> yeah, so let me, right after the light showed up. In, yeah. yeah, so let me, let me give you, um, I'll give you kind of a 50,000 foot view and, and maybe it'll be helpful for your listeners. So... Um, I graduated in, I graduated from college and business, uh, went on and got an MBA, spent about 12 or 13 years in the corporate world, mainly in finance, uh, uh, wall street type stuff, uh, wall street investments, teaching people how to trade stock markets, things, things of that nature. Um, throughout that process, uh, started investing in real estate. Um, and then in 2016, uh, broke off. No, I take that back. 2000, 2015 left the corporate world, started my own, my own construction company. Uh, and then started a property management company off of that later, shut the construction company down. Um, we were doing mainly concrete and concrete is just kind of stresses me out just because mm. if you screw it up, dude, it's expensive. <laughs> like <laughs> super expensive. If you screw it up. So from there, I uh, started a property management company, have been building that since 2016. I uh, got to a point where we were just really struggling with um, finding vendors. So here, here was, here's kind of what would happen. And it was rinse and repeat probably six or seven different times in about a three, three year period of time. A handyman would come to us and be like, hey, I'm starting a handyman business. Um, do you have any work for me? So I'd feed them some work. Um, and then they, if, if they did, let's, just, let's just, there were some crappy dudes that I never <laughs> fed any more work again, but let's assume they did a good job about six months later, I couldn't find them. Cause they were just so busy. Like they mm -hmm. just were overwhelmed and too busy. And so then another guy would come through the door. Hey, I'm starting a handyman business. Do you have any work for me? So I, I'd feed him some work and same thing. Six months later, gone. If he lasted six <laughs> months, cause he just got so busy. So. So we got to the point where we're like, well, let's just bring all the maintenance in house, right? So we can control it, right? Control the the customer experience and, and things of that nature. So we brought maintenance in house um, and started working on our portfolio of the properties that we own, as well as the ones that we managed, um, all with our own team. Uh, and, just out of curiosity, uh, too, Nick, uh, like how 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 many years did you go with uh, feeding the guy jobs, and then six months later, he dropped off? A it it was years? probably. So we brought in-house maintenance in probably a year, a year and a half before um, we actually started servicing handyman client, like what I would consider retail handyman clients, like yeah. people that we don't manage their property. So I'm going to, so we've been, the property management business has been, in, it's been in business since 2016. So what are we, 2022 right now? So that's six years. So I'm going to say, let's call it three and a half, four years, hmm. something like that. With you know that's that's a ballpark guessment that I ha I'd have to go and figure it out for sure, but but probably right. Let's call it okay. four years, right? So four years of of this this cycle, and we're talking. I mean, you've got your you know your HVAC companies, your plumbers, kind of those people that specialize, but it's the handyman piece of it that we, they would just they'd come in, they do a pretty good job, they'd get overwhelmed, get too busy, they'd be gone, mm -hmm. and either be gone meaning like they just had too much work, and sometimes be gone being like like. <laughs> I'm a good technician, but I can't run a business. So mm -hmm. like, I'm out. <laughs> like I'm yeah. out of the industry. Right. <laughs> so, um, so with that said, so we brought it in house, we, we got some systems and processes in place to figure that out. Um, I was doing a lot of, a lot of the maintenance stuff. I would have some guys help me is that we're kind of dialing in the systems and processes. And then I don't know, I can't remember what kind of sparked it, but, um, we got to a point where I was like, you know, I think we could actually service retail customers. And what I mean by retail customers is I'm talking about people who have no business relationship with us on the property management side of business, but people are just like, Hey, I need something done on my house. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just looking for a handyman. 
And so we started to kind of venture into that world to say, hey, is there a market for it? Mm. Um, and and found out very quickly that there is a market for it. And we'll probably get into it a little bit later as to why there is a market for it. But uh, yeah, so started there. And then from there, um, uh, have have been trying to build a team of quote unquote handyman uh, ever since. So that was, we started servicing retail clients probably a year and a half ago, mm. maybe, maybe just under a year and a half ago, but probably a year and a half ago, we started servicing retail clients. So awesome. A uh, question that comes up for me is uh, what's the difference between your retail clients and the commercial that you're actually managing their property? Like, is there any kind of uh, difference there? Cause the technicians it's, it's all kind of the same for them. Is that correct? Well, yeah. So there's a couple differences. One pricing structure, meaning okay. that the people that we manage their properties, they get uh, a discounted price, right? Because there's there's several different revenue streams, and maintenance is just one of those revenue streams. So we want to offer them as competitive of a price as we can if we're going to do that maintenance in house, because mm -hmm. we want to maintain that relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So retail customers, the prices are higher, meaning our labor rates are. Um, our labor charges are higher. Um, our uh, our supply markups are basically the same, but so we charge more for labor. That's one of the differences. The other difference is on the property management side, I would say 80% of the stuff that you do on the property management side is the same. So unit turns, inspections, a lot of it's the same. Whereas on the retail customer side, like they're asking, what I'm finding is they're asking for things to be done that they can't find anybody else to do. So like a general contractor isn't going to show up to do that. Mm -hmm. Or oftentimes people in their right mind aren't going to show up to do that. Those, those, <laughs> those are the, the types of jobs that retail customers are asking for. And so the skill set has to be like, you have to have a vast skill set to service retail clients, which is part of the challenge of, of building a handyman business is finding guys that, that maybe they've never tackled it before, but they have the ability to, to look at the issue or look at the project and start to think through what does it take to, to fix this or what does it take to build this? So that's a big difference is the scope of projects is, um, is more inter or more, I would say more difficult on the retail customer side. Mm -hmm. um, just because the reason they're calling you is because they can't find anybody else that's that's willing to do it, do it. You know, yeah. Right. And so just to kind of clarify in, in my brain and maybe some of the listeners here, but um, so like property management, basically that means that people who own rentals, they would hire you to manage their property, correct? Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Okay. So we are, we're a full service property management company, meaning investors own properties and they're okay. like, Hey, I love real estate. I want to own real estate, but I don't want, I don't want to deal with it. So we take that from start to finish, meaning we market the property, we find tenants, we screen tenants, we hold tenants accountable to the leases. And part of that is maintenance, right? Just routine mm -hmm. maintenance or, you know, maybe something happened like a, you know, a, a main drain line backed up or a toilet, you know, just the, just the normal stuff that happens with property. So our maintenance division take care, takes care of that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's right. So basically like the tenant would call you as the property management company and say, Hey, my toilet's backing up and I can't unclog it. And then you would basically call the, you'd, you'd create an estimate and then call the owner and be like, this, this is the cost to repair it or no, how would that no, work? Good, yeah, that's a good question. So part of every property management company does it a little bit different. Mm -hmm. The way that we do it is we're full service. Meaning if you hand us the keys to manage your property, you're handing us control of your property times 10, meaning hmm. we have full autonomy to make the decisions that need to be made to make sure that that property runs effectively Okay, within a certain scope, right? Mm -hmm. like I feel like not, that would draw some like, like, have good to trust clientele. The fact that we're going to do it correctly and we're not going to be like, oh, hey, this property needs a new garage. You know, there's a hundred thousand bucks, but right. But so there, there's certain things that tenants are responsible for. So like a clogged toilet, like that's actually a tenant responsibility. Like unclog your own toilet. Like I'm not, <laughs> if you, we will, we'll come out there and unclog it for you, but tenant, we're going to charge you for it. In right. order for us to charge the owner for it, something has to be broken mm -hmm. that the tenant didn't cause. Right. So, um, an issue we just ran into the other day was 
was we found, and I, I don't know, we haven't managed this property for very long, but, and I don't know how long the owners owned it, but we found in the basement that the drain lines were not plumbed correctly. Mm. And so when the toilet, when the, when the tenant would flush the toilet, the floor drain would back up. Well, mm. after we scoped the lines and, and all that, what we basically figured out is whoever plumbed it, plumbed the, the bathroom sink, the floor drain, the tub and the toilet all on a, uh, a four-way intersection. Hmm. So all of those would converge on a four-way intersection rather than each of those feeding kind of their, their, uh, their own, um, Y into the main hmm. line. So the, the tub would drain and go exactly to the toilet. And, and what's interesting hmm. enough is the toilet <laughs> was on top of this whole four, four-way intersection. So, crap would hit the bottom of the 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 uh drain line and just go four different ways <laughs> rather right, than right. like down where it was supposed to so that you know that was an issue that uh that we had run into recently with with a property in which we fixed like property management mm. has to fix that because mm-hmm. you know they can't jack up a hammer concrete and redo drain lines and things like that do you guys focus residential uh like is that kind of the specialty for yeah. the for the rent management yeah. yep okay. for for the property management piece that's our that's our specialty is is residential mm. we've got a couple uh, commercial buildings but residential is the the specialty mm. so which feeds nicely into the handyman business okay right. and that was going to be kind of my connecting question is like the the original spawn of the handyman residential retail as you call it um was just because you already had the infrastructure and it's like, can we add this new revenue line? Yeah. So, so think about it this way. So, so a general contractor, they're set up to, to basically come and do big projects, right? Like, Hey, I want to do this addition onto my house, or I want to remodel my entire house, or I want to build a house, something like that. What they're not set up for is I have a project that's going to take anywhere from one hour to three days. That's very hard for a general contractor to show up to. Cause he's like, I'm just not set yeah. up for it. Where we, we've got our guys running around in vans with 80% of the tools that they're ever going to need for any job that they run into are sitting inside those vans and a pretty good handful of the needed supplies that they're going to run into, mm-hmm. at least on the property management side. So, so our sweet spot in the handyman business is, hey, if this job takes one hour to three days, that's our sweet spot. And in fact, if the job takes more than three days, like it takes a lot of scheduling on our end to make sure that we can fit everything in from a scheduling perspective in order to take care of clients. It's not that we can't do the work. It's just, it, that's not our sweet spot, right? The sweet spot mm-hmm. is in and out and, and on to the next, on to the next job. So. Yeah. Hmm. That's good. So, so to get, I'm still trying to, I mean, I, I got kind of the gist of this property manager thing, but I just want to be clear. Like, so when you do the property management for a, uh, homeowner's house or a uh, landlord's house, basically, there's no estimate process. Like you just go out, do the work and and then bill the client or take the money out of their portal or whatever, as yeah. long as nothing's broken. Yeah. Most, right. most of the time. So if it's a big project, meaning that uh, um, I'm trying to think of something that we did recently. So you're correct. I would say 90% of the times on the property management side, it's billed as time and materials. Right. Mm-hmm. We just we just go and fix it. You build whatever time it took us our my maintenance guy to do it and whatever materials it cost us to do it. That's what you build. But we will do estimates for larger stuff. So uh sometimes when a tenant will move out and the mm-hmm. owner will say, Hey, I actually want I don't want to just turn this property, but I want to remodel it. So mm-hmm. I want to do new kitchen cabinets, some new flooring. We'll give estimates for that for owners, um, so that they know, okay, you know, it's gonna mm-hmm. cost me 20 grand or 30 grand or you know, 10 grand, whatever the case may be. But 90% of what we do is just time. It's built as time and materials on the property management side. Cause it, right. most of it's just little stuff, right? Mm-hmm. It's just l- little things that we're fixing. So and will it. you guys do the actual remodels? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We've done. Yeah, we have. Yeah, we will. We, I'm trying to think mm-hmm. we've probably done half a dozen so far this year. Okay. Of, That's good. Of remodels. So what is what does the estimate process look like in your as you call it the retail clients? Like, do you do the technicians go out and give the estimates, or do you have an estimator, or what does that look like? Um, so we're not that big yet. So I still do all the estimating. In fact, last okay. week I sent one of my guys to go look at a job to start to train him on how to estimate. 
right? Yeah. So, and this is, this is the process. This is how I do it. And I don't know if it's right, wrong or, or indifferent, but I've got, I've got an Excel spreadsheet, right? And, it, and in that Excel spreadsheet, I've got our, our labor rate. So that labor rate is how much it, everything's built into that labor rate. So how much do I have to pay my technicians? What's my labor burden? What's my profit? You know, what's my wear and tear on tools, whatever the case may be. And so that labor rate sitting uh, at the top of this Excel spreadsheet. And then the way that I go and, and bid a project is I'll look at the project and I've got enough experience that, and I've built enough stuff from the ground up that I can basically look at something and peel it back in my mind and be like, okay, what are the layers to, you know, let me give you an example. Um, let's say that I was going to, let's say there was a flood in the basement, right? And we needed to, uh, to do some mold mitigation and, and rebuild the basement. Like I can peel that back in my mind, right? Like, okay, you got to take off the sheetrock. Once you take the sheetrock off, you're going to have insulation back. You're going to have to peel, peel that back. Studs mm -hmm. may or may not be moldy. You know, you may have to replace some studs. Uh, plumbing is probably okay. Uh, depending on what happened, you know, mo your electrical probably should be okay, but you may have to, you know, re redo some electrical. So that's mm -hmm. a simple example of like, I can just peel those layers back in my mind and mm -hmm. say, okay, once we peel that back, then we're going to have to put it back together. Right. So right. then and we're going to have to re-put it in, you know, put some more insulation in, re-sheet rock it, mud and tape it, uh, paint it, you know, put up baseboards, caulk, paint, all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, light fixtures, light switches, things like that. So the way that I bid things is I, on this spreadsheet is I will take each item that's going to take place, you know, tear down sheetrock. That'll be one line item. Um, remove insulation. That'll be the next line item. And I just peel this back to where I think I'm going to get to the root of the problem. And then I start to build it back in. Right. Uh, uh, you know, kill and clean mold. And then it'll be like reinstall new insulation, um, hang new sheetrock. Hmm. mud and tape, install baseboards, caulk, paint prep, you know, paint. And so, you know, I may have a list of, you know, five hmm. to 20, actually I've, I've done some lately. I think my most is I had like 147 line items that <laughs> wow, needed to be completed. Right. Okay. And then what I do is I say, okay, if I'm the only guy on this job, how long do I think it's going to take me to remove that sheetrock? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, whatever the size of the room is, I think it would take me four hours to remove all of the sheetrock, have it hauled out side to a dumpster and broom swept. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Four hours. And then, and then the Excel spreadsheet does the calculations four right. times, whatever the rate is and, and, and it feeds it out. But then what I've got in there is I've got a line in there that, so I'm trying to think of a sheetrock is kind of a good example. It's not a great example, but some things take more than one guy, right? right. Like, like there's just like, I can't hang a 16 foot beam by myself. <laughs> I guess I could, if I had several pieces of the equipment, but you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. Hey, it may take two or three guys. So if one of those line items is like, Hey, I think it's going to take me four four hours to do. Mm -hmm. I'll put four hours in there, but I'm like, this is a two man job. Mm -hmm. So then on that spreadsheet, it's got a two. So now it's, now it's calculating my labor rate times the four hours times two guys. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And right. That, and so that just extrapolates out to the end of the spreadsheet. And by the time those line items are done, I, it, it's built out how many man hours I think it's going to take to complete this job. Sometimes we nail it. Sometimes you don't. Right. So, mm -hmm. so um, that's how, it, that's how it happens from the labor perspective. And then on that same spreadsheet, I've just got another section that's for supplies. So given the same example, you know, removing sheetrock. Okay. I'm going to need to either rent a dumpster or I'm going to need to bring our dump trailer in here to, to, to haul this stuff off. Right. So mm -hmm. that's a supply, you know, right. Uh, insulation, you know, how much insulation is it going to take me? How much sheets are it going to take me? And so you just build out that supply list on that same spreadsheet and calculate, you know, what, the, what that cost is. And, uh, and then that's, it does its magic calculations and a bada bing, bada boom. So that's huge. That's, I, that's I love, I love that way of estimating. Cause it's like, you're, you're literally just writing down every single thing you need to do and every single thing you need to put back up. So, yeah. uh, that's super smart.
because I think the best way to know your numbers is to write them down, figure it out. Um, I love your, your way of kind of reverse engineering that. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you got to that labor rate? You know, cause you mentioned a few things in there. Is that fully encompassing everything that it takes to run your business? And then is it adding in some profit? Like, do you mind kind of talking a little bit about yeah, that? I'll, you, I'll break yeah. down exactly how I did it. And I, and honestly, I don't know that it, I don't know that it's perfect. So let me, and, and I'll, I'll expand on that, that spreadsheet a little bit. So okay. what, the way that I did it is I said, okay. And it's, it's different now that I have guys, but when it was me, I was like, okay, what do I want to make an hour? Right. Whatever that dollar amount is. Um, I actually, let me use my guys right now. So when I, when I hired guys, I kind of put their numbers in there rather than, than having my numbers in there. Cause I'll be quite frank with you at this point. I'm like, if I've got to be on the job, the price just went up. Cause I right. <laughs> just, it's, it's right. Yeah. I, like it just has to be that way or we don't have a business. So mm-hmm. So what I've done is I put my guys' labor rates in there and I just take the average, right? So this last summer I was up to six guys. Now I'm down to three, but I'll mm-hmm. just take whatever their average is. Let's call it, uh, let's call it 25 bucks, right? In Utah, the the labor rate for handyman is, is between about 18 to 25. Um, and which I, it, that's actually it, on a side note, I think that that, I think we're going to see that rise. Like it's, it's very tough to keep labor for, for those prices anymore. Anyways, right. mm-hmm. so I'll just take, so let's say I got to pay my, t- my guy 25 bucks. Right. And so then you got to put taxes on that. Well, you've got payroll taxes. So, you know, whatever the percentage of payroll taxes is, I can't remember off the top of my head, but let's call it, um, let's just make the numbers. Easy. Let's call it 10%. Right. Yeah. So yeah. For, for my guy, it's 10.07%. Yeah. You know? So yeah, let's make it easy. So it's 10%, right? So now, mm-hmm. now it's 2750. Okay. Well, he's driving around with my truck, right? So mm-hmm. how much does my truck cost me on a, on a, on a monthly basis? Right. So mm-hmm. we've got, we've got sprinter vans. We've got uh, a little Ford transit vans. We've got a, a, a diesel truck. So we've got a couple different vehicles out there. So I basically take the average of the cost of all of those vehicles um, and say, okay, what's, what's that going to take? And I wish I had the numbers better off the top of my head, but let's just, let's just say, it, you know, if a guy's going to work full time, so 2,080 hours a, um, a year. And we're still here by the way, Nick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I saw you, I saw you, you freeze there, but anyways, so let's say a guy's going to, you know, work 2,080 hours. I'll take that number. Mm-hmm. Of however long, however much those vehicles cost me on a yearly basis, I'll divide that by two thousand and eighty, and I'll add that. So let's just call that let's let's just call it three dollars an hour, right? So now what are we at? We're at thirty dollars and fifty cents. Mm-hmm. Well, those trucks don't run for free, so there's maintenance and fuel and all that stuff. So I'll I'll take that number. What is, what's that number going to be? And then I'll add that in there. So let's just call that it's another dollar. So what are mm-hmm. we at? We're at thirty thirty one dollars and fifty cents. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you've got in, insurance, right? So you got general liability insurance, you got workman's competent insurance, all that stuff. Let's just say that that's four bucks. So now you're at 35 bucks for, for, for labor. Um, these numbers are off because that number is really, really low, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you guys get, you guys get the yeah. idea. So, yeah. mm-hmm. so just to break even is I've got to have, I got to charge 35 bucks an hour just to break even. And that's assuming that I get, I nail my estimates, right? Mm-hmm. That's assuming mm-hmm. that when I bid a hundred man hours or 50 man hours or 20 man hours, that we get it done in 20 man hours. Mm-hmm. So then on top of that, you have to go, okay, what do I want? What do I want to make as a profit? Right? So mm-hmm. let's say you want to make a 20% profit. You would just add 20% to that. So let's just say you come out and you're like 45 bucks an hour. That's what you'd make. If you got everything right, that's right. what you would make, you know, and you, and you'd make 20% profit. That's how I've built it out that. So that number is super low. So I don't know exactly where I got the, the, the dollar amounts. Cause, cause I know what our labor rate is and it's, it's more than double that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. so those yeah, numbers okay. are low. Mm-hmm. But that's, that's how, that's how I built it out is, is what's our cost? What do I want to make? Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. 
go from there. And, and what, I mean, the beautiful thing about having a, having a business like this is you can name your prices, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then people can choose whether they want to do business with you or not. Mm -hmm. So if your prices are competitive, people will probably choose to do business with you and you'll probably get overwhelmed with business, Mm -hmm. right? And if your prices are too high, people will choose not to do business with you and you're going to either learn to adjust your prices, lower your costs, or you're just going to go out of business. Right. right? Supply and demand. Yep. Yeah, it's a supply and demand thing. So you've just kind of got to finesse you know, what that looks like and, and you know, how, how that works for you. Yeah. That's 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 how I built it out. Yeah. I love it. Thanks for explaining that. Yeah. I mean, we, we do something very similar. I mean, it's basically the same kind of calculation. It's just, there's more than one way to skin a cat, you know? So we actually start from like the full expenses from the business and then basically multiply that by 20%, multiply it by another 20%. And then divide it by the hours worked in any given month and then basically break it down to an hourly rate from that way. Whereas I think you started from the hourly rate and went the other way. But it's yeah. it's all it's all the same stuff. And so know? and you know, you know what's good, and I could probably so when we started doing it, like we didn't have that data, right? Like what mm-hmm. are the business expenses? Right. I don't know yeah. for sure. <laughs> I could yeah. probably go back now. Well, I could go back now and say, okay, I could say, well, you know, what did we spend last year? What have we spent year to day? And we could probably back into it like you've talked about. So let me let me explain to you on and this goes back to the estimating. So that number is that number is good if you get everything else right. And right. for me, what I found is, dude, sometimes I get it right and sometimes I don't. So, mm-hmm. so on top of that number, I kind of build in a buffer, you know, yeah. a little bit of a buffer of like, hey, I'm going to win some, I'm going to lose some. Um, so I need a little bit of, of cushion there for the ones that I don't get right. Mm-hmm. Like I, I'm remembering a job last summer, we bid... Uh, Dude, we bid two guys two days and it took two guys three days. So mm-hmm. I was I was 16 hours right short over yeah. what what I had estimated, right? But, yeah. but sometimes sometimes that happens. So and then back to my spreadsheet. So on top of that spreadsheet, what I've done is I've also put small percentages in for little things like, hey, how how long does it take to set up? How long does it take to tear down on a daily basis? Because Mm -hmm. let's say that, let's say that rate is $45. Well, that's assuming you're swinging a hammer for eight hours, but we all know that like you're chasing materials. And if it's an, if it's an estimated job, not time and materials, but an estimated job, you got to build in the, that, that, um, that time spent chasing materials, setting up table saws, tearing down sample table saws, sweet broom sweeping, things like that. So, so if I think, you know, if I think a line item is going to take me four hours, by the time my Excel spreadsheet's done at the end of that calculation, it may have four hours and 15 minutes built into it because right. I've, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? To kind of help with that, help with that labor cushion a little bit. Yeah. So. That, that's smart because we, we actually did a poll uh, recently in the handyman journey um, Facebook mastermind group and the majority of people work about 80% efficiency. So uh, in any typical eight hour day, most people get about six to six and a half hours worth of work done, like build hours done in an yeah. eight hour day. And you got to factor that in. That's huge when you're factoring in price, because Mm -hmm. if you're thinking that a technician is going to go out there and do eight hours of billable work in an eight hour day, you're pretty crazy, you know? And to be honest with you, if you're at 80% efficiency, I, dude, I think you're slaying it. Like Mm -hmm. I, I, there's days, if I was the guy on the job, there's days I could get that, but there's a lot of days I never got that. And, and very seldom will my guys get 80% efficiency. Mm -hmm. They what just, would you say? What would you say is the majority of efficiency that you've seen in your particular business, dude? I'll bet um, sixty to seventy percent is pretty yeah. average. Mm-hmm. Um, just because. So here's the other thing about a handyman business that I found: like if you're a roofer, dude, you can you can call a roofing company and you can have all of those supplies ordered and delivered on the job site because you. This is what you do all day every day. Right. You know exactly what you need. Mm-hmm. As a handyman, you don't necessarily know everything you're going to need. Like you're going to show up to a job and you and you've gathered all the supplies you think you're going to need, and then you're on the job and you're like, "Dude, 
I need this one $3 part that yep. I got to run five miles to the supplier to get to come. Like, dude, that happens yep. all the time in the handyman business because you just, you can't, it's impossible to um, plan for everything mm-hmm. because there, and there's times and we're, we're refining this now, but dude, there was times we'd go to the job and there was like, let's say $50 worth of supplies built in. We'd walk out of the store with $200 worth of supplies because we didn't want to come back. Right. No, just buy it all. Buy, buy it all. all and then we'll return figure out what, what we, need. we don't use on the next trip. I have and, been there so many times. Yes. Yeah. Because it's, it's such a waste of time. In fact, I've got yeah. a, I got a buddy that's out of business now. He, he, he uh, started a business maybe a year and a half ago and he's out of business now because he, he couldn't, he couldn't solve it. it like mm-hmm. he would be at the suppliers four times a day. Yeah. Um, and so he was just like half of his day was spent chasing supplies and, and yeah. so he just didn't make any money. It's, it's a rough thing for sure. One thing that we found that helped uh, kind of curb it a little bit, but obviously it adds to expenses uh, is getting a technician assistant. So basically we have a guy that he's, he's just really a parts guy, you know? So every Monday he, Uh, works with our estimator, picks up all the materials that were ordered for the jobs that week, delivers them at every single job. And then throughout the week, he's working with the technician as a second set of hands and also a really a, you know, a parts guy. So if, if you need to get that $3 part, you can send the tech assistant while the technician goes and works on something else at the house. And it's really been a time saver because you're sending a guy um, that is, you know, maybe is a little bit less skilled than the technician to go out and get, get the materials, but that's still a huge value because you're not having to take an hour away from the technician to go and get that part. Yeah. I, I actually think that's a, that's a great idea. The, so are they delivering supplies? So let's say he, he picks up supplies on Monday. Are they delivering the, all the jobs? Like the job that's going to happen on Friday is he delivering supplies on Monday to that job. So you just yeah. tell the, the client, Hey, we're going to drop supplies off or whatever. Yep. So basically it's up to him to, you know, call the clients. Uh, Basically Monday is uh, a day where the technician works by himself and the technician assistant just does materials. So he's, you know, spends whatever the first quarter, the first half of his day at Home Depot, picking up materials and then delivering to each job, calling the clients, being like, Hey, can I drop this stuff off? Obviously it's, if it's raining or whatnot, you drop it off in the uh, in the garage or wherever the client will allow you to, but yeah, it's, it's really increased our productivity by having that technician assistant. Dude, that's a, that's a good, uh, that's a good idea. I, uh, I was talking to some guys, um, last week and they were talking about a local, it's a plumbing and it's a plumbing company here in, in town, but he was like, they are the most efficient that I've ever seen. So what they do and they're a big company, right? They're not just the one man handyman band. They're like mm-hmm. a big company. So their guys show up at night and park their trucks at the, at the facility. Well, mm-hmm. first they built their facility across the street from their supplier. So <laughs> game changer, number one, nice. Number two, their guys show up uh, at night and park their trucks. And then they have an overnight crew and it's on a big, like, like spinning table, like a big roundabout, if you will, that just has all of the supplies that they wow. use on a daily basis. And so all night long, they've got guys stocking their trucks with the, with the supplies that the, that technician's going to need for the next day. So that's the beautiful. Goes up, turns on the key, away he goes off to the next job. He's like, it's the most efficient that I've wow. ever seen. That's beautiful. Cause that's, that's the one issue we always encounter. Like when you're doing like PVC stuff, right? You're always yeah. like, Oh, I need this one PVC adapter. And I have like 50 million on the truck, but I just don't have this one, you yeah. know? So that's always the trouble is like, how do you stock everything, you know, without stocking everything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and that's the thing. That's the challenge of the handyman business, right? Is, mm-hmm. is you just run into so many different scenarios. So for example, a laundry drain by code is a two inch ABS pipe. Well, you show up to a house that was built 30 years ago and somebody thought it was a good idea to put in an inch and a half. Right. Right. Like, unless I'm replumbing <laughs> this whole thing, I got to go get an inch and a half elbow, mm-hmm. you know, or yeah. an inch and a half P trap. So mm-hmm. yeah, you just run into that kind of stuff all the time. It's not like you can tell the client, like the whole story of like, well, it should be two inch, but they put in an inch and a half. So we're gonna have to charge you extra for this. Like, yeah, nah, cause they don't happen. care. Right? <laughs> no, they don't, they don't yeah. care at all. Yeah. <laughs> 30 years here's ago. A, here's, an, here's an interesting thing. Um, from, 
from an estimating standpoint that I try to explain to clients and I get, I understand why they don't get it, but I've done, I've done a test in our own business. And, um, when I estimate something, I'm taking on the risk, right? Like as the, as the business owner, I'm taking on the risk because if we spend more on supplies or we spend more on labor, I'm going to have to eat that. So what do you think I'm going to do on my estimates? I'm going to, I'm going to build in a buffer, right? Like if if I literally think it's going to cost a thousand dollars, your estimates probably going to come back at 1200, right? Or 1100 or whatever. Um, Whereas if I'm building time and materials, the client's taking the risk, right? So, so oftentimes what I found in our business is if a client would choose to allow us to build them time and materials, they would ultimately save money because we don't run into that many scenarios in which like, like mm-hmm. it's a game changer to where like, Oh uh, yeah, you know, it's not going to be a thousand bucks. It's going to be three. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that's something, and I don't know, you know, how every handyman runs their business. If I could choose, if I could just be like, Hey, we're only going to do time and materials. I would probably do that. Cause I think you could run a faster, more efficient business because estimating dude just takes yeah the, so much time. And, the, and I actually, I got to the point where I'm like, we don't, we don't go, we don't do onsite assessments. Well, we do, but you have to pay us a hundred bucks. Right. Yeah. We, we do the same thing. And the, the, the issue with time and materials though, that I found is you typically, as you get quicker, you don't get paid for that quicker knowledge and that learning experience, you know? So like back when you started, it took you say an hour and a half to do a ceiling fan. Well, now you can do that same ceiling fan in 30 minutes. You're actually making less money than you used to make. That's the, that's the one issue that I found with it. You're a hundred percent right. So except for, I would just build in a, a floor. Right. So, oh, so like a minimum. Yeah. So for us, okay. we have a minimum, our minimum. And it's, it's honestly, it's changed. It changes like on a weekly basis, depending <laughs> on how busy we are. but it fluctuates between 250 and 300, $350. Mm-hmm. That's a minimum. So you need it to come change a battery and a smoke detector. It's 250 bucks. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so, and, and I understand that that's a turnoff for some people. Cause they're like, Oh, you're gouging us. And and I get where they're coming from, but I'm also like, yeah, but you're also not paying for these trucks and guys and insurance. Right. And just like, I just can't send a guy out to, for 10 bucks to change your, you know, no, it doesn't battery. make any sense. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. So from business. That perspective. would be the only way to get around the floor of the time and materials, but that only works if it's a 30 minute job or an hour job. Right. If, right. If it's a 10 hour job that takes you five hours because you're so efficient. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. That. You're, you're gonna over, you're gonna hose yourself. Yeah, you're over your threshold and you're well you know. except for the other way the, the way to get around that is just raise your raise your hourly, hourly rate. Right. Yeah, so that's true. Yeah. So instead of charging, I don't know, a hundred bucks an hour, maybe you charge two hundred bucks an hour. So mm-hmm. that's that's one way to get around it. So mm-hmm. I'm curious, uh, between the different kind of clients at so the retail and then your uh, the property management is like when the work orders come through, like is there one that's better? Like, do you prefer, like, like, what do you think between having both retail clients, which is most, most Tannaman businesses are residential, you know, yeah. they just service the, the retail residential market, but you're unique in that you have this maintenance division where it made sense to expand, but you get work orders through, you know, those property management clients yeah. already. Is there, is there any difference in the kind of client or the job or getting paid or like, so, is there any so there's pros and cons? Right? Yeah. So the property management side, the pro is there's no marketing involved. Uh, mm-hmm. When the well, I take that back. The marketing that's involved is on the property management side. So in our owners agreement or management agreement is when they hire us to manage their property, we have full control over the maintenance. So guy can't own the property and want to come swing a hammer. Like no, nope, everything goes to our maintenance department. So from a from a marketing standpoint for the maintenance division, there is no marketing, right? We win a hundred percent of that business that we can do anything we right. can do. We outsource to vendors. Um, but it's a volume game, meaning that our margins on that business isn't as high because 
you, we we offer that that service at a discounted labor rate. Yeah, the maintenance piece manage, of it. Yeah, because we manage their property and we want to take care of these owners and we want this to be a, a long-term relationship. So that's the advantage of, of the property management piece. The retail client piece, um, from a profitability standpoint, there's, you just make more money. That's mm-hmm. just the way that it is because there's... I mean, a few clients will turn into long-term relationship clients, but most of these people you see once, one time, like we, we've gotten in the year and a half that we've been servicing retail clients, we've probably only had 20 repeat customers just because, and I don't know if those other customers went somewhere else or if, you know, we just, you know, they don't, they didn't have anything that else that needs that needed to be done. But most of the time you just don't see, I, it, that's been my experience. Like I, we just don't see these people mm-hmm. again. So, um, so the, the, the pricing on the retail side, it's, it's retail pricing basically. Right. Mm-hmm. So the margins are a little bit higher. So that's the advantage of that. But I will say we spend more time um, on the retail customer jobs because I tell my guys, like, I'm like, we charge a premium, but like, I already know that. So we got to make sure that the quality is there and that we do it right. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so, so the stress level on the retail client side is a little bit higher because I just want to make sure that they're super happy because I already know they're paying a premium. Yeah. And part of that is we provide an, absolute quality service. The other part of it is we are just so busy that we've had to raise our rates in order to just kind of weed out um, the, like, like we just kind of have to outprice some people, which it's getting to the point where it's turning people off. And and so this is actually something that I'm struggling with is because it's getting to the point where it's turning people off because they're just like, you guys are way too expensive and the what what i already know we're expensive but part of the reason we're so expensive is because we're so busy that uh, like honestly if you wanted me to do your job we probably aren't going to be able to get to it till january Uh, like we're having this conversation right now the end of september Mm -hmm. we are if we didn't take one ounce of work not one inkling of work we are booked out to the first part of December. Hmm. Um, just full on. That's between property management and retail clients that we already have in the books. Mm-hmm. We've we've got some bigger projects that retail clients have been waiting for. They paid us a deposit two months ago. Yeah. Um, they're just barely. You know, we're starting. We're starting one of those jobs next week because that's how long it's taken to get on our schedule. So back to a pricing standpoint is is I understand that some people get turned off and frustrated, which for me as a business owner is a little bit stressful because that's not the reputation I want, but it's a necessary evil in order to just to be able to service the the current workload that we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got to be able to take care of folks that, you know, you have an obligation to, and you know, if you don't have the labor and the technicians to go out and get there faster, like you're just not going to do anyone any service by taking on a job, biting off more than you can chew. Well, right. and, and, and so that, that was, that was part of the reason that our rates got raised is because we were just getting inundated with requests. Right. And, and we would win the work and then we're like, yeah, they're like, so when can you come? We're like <laughs> in seven weeks. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, what? Yeah. We're like happy to give you your deposit back. That's, but, but that's just, you know, that's where we're at. So. Right. Um, so yeah, it, it's a, it, I've, I've said this a million times. If I could find six solid handyman, I could have them a hundred percent busy in 30 days. Hmm. Um, it's right now the biggest, the biggest problem in the industry is labor. If you're a one man handyman band, dude, like you could absolutely slay it, but you're going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to get people trying to hire handyman is that's, that's uh that's one of the challenges right now in the business. Have you, uh, any tips or how have you hired the technicians that you have or any kind of learning, uh, from, you know, trying to find quality labor? Yeah. So 
I mean, I've hired people that I know. Um, I've used uh, Indeed. I've tried Temp Labor. In fact, we've got a Temp Labor guy starting tomorrow. I haven't had any success with Temp Labor. In fact, I'm going to be on the job tomorrow afternoon um, just to monitor this Temp Labor guy because if he's like the last Temp Labor guy, like I'm pulling him off the job and yeah, being like, hey, this isn't working out. So, um. It's there's I haven't found a secret saw. So I had a handyman that worked for me for about a year. He was a guy I knew and um, he did a great job. And he just, he, he wanted to, it, it was kind of a, and we kind of knew this when I hired him, it was kind of a, a gap fill between him really wanting to leave his other job to trying to find, find something else. In fact, he probably stayed around longer than he originally anticipated he was going to. So he was great. Um, another kid I hired, I knew, um, I had, a, you know, I, I knew him and, and mm-hmm. he was, he's a younger guy. So I've had to teach him, train him, uh, which is totally fine. Cause he's willing to learn and, and he's been awesome. Uh, I got another guy I found on indeed, um, that, uh, you know, out of three or four guys I've hired from indeed, he's the only one that's, that's worked so far. I had mm-hmm. one guy last a day. <laughs> <laughs> And I had another guy last like a week. So hmm. I don't have any secret sauce on it. I mean, I, we're always kind of beating the bushes, you know, telling people we're, yeah. we're looking for guys we're hiring. Um, so I, w- I wish I had, I wish I had the the secret to that, but I, I simply don't at this point. Mm-hmm. You're not alone. <laughs> I know, that's, that's the biggest struggle of, um, of, of any handyman business that's trying to, you know, take it above three or four or five guys. Uh, it's just finding, you know, quality labor. Um, well, it's and, and it's up. not only that, like to find quality labor. So let's go back to the roofing example. If I'm a roofing company and I find a guy that's willing to work, I can teach him how to roof. Mm-hmm. And in about two weeks, he's going to uh, perform that same task probably a half a dozen times. Right, right. In the handyman business, he may do something today that he might not see for in another three months. Yep, or see again in another three. So you've got to, like, the skill set to be a handyman, in my opinion, is higher than most other uh, blue collar uh, jobs because you have to be a jack of all trades. You have to understand how to do a mostly everything versus Mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, I know how to install residential roofs or I know how to build decks. It's just a different, so on top of trying to find good labor, being able to, that, that good labor, being able to have a vast, knowledge set yeah to perform handyman yeah work. it's just totally different we were talking yeah. earlier uh you know with hvac it's like oh well we need some new technicians well <laughs> who just graduated and got their their certificate you right. know right. there's no handyman certificate well so did you bring it <laughs> up like this, this thing's too. been turning into my head i'm like man it may be time to start a handyman school like yeah yep. here's a handyman like you come to school like here's a handyman certificate mm-hmm. because I've looked because I look to like send my guys to trainings and stuff too. I, I haven't found anything out there that yeah, that, uh, outside of YouTube that mm-hmm. is, you know, yeah. that's, that's that basically works. the handyman university. <laughs> yeah. It's the handyman journey. That's, that's what we're working on creating here. It's just a place that can educate, you know, handyman. Yeah. So, cause I think that's definitely needed for sure. Well, it's, it's really needed because, um, you kind of think, and this is what, this is what younger guys don't understand. So as you guys know, like, as I stated earlier, I spent 12 years in the finance world, right? So corporate America, suit tie, not suit tie, but, but business clothes, blah, 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 blah. Um, and guys aren't going through high school or graduating and being like, man, I'm going to be a handyman when I grow up. Like, nobody's <laughs> doing that. They're going to be like, I'm going to be a venture capitalist or I'm going to be a YouTube influencer or whatever Mm -hmm. the case may be. What they don't understand is the way that society is going. Dude, handymen are going to be some of the highest paid people in the next five to 10 years because the dudes that know how to do it are in their 50s and 60s and getting ready to leave the market. The young kids coming up have zero desire to learn how to do the work because it's not sexy. Like, let's mm-hmm. face it, it's not sexy work. But the but but 
the demand is not going to go away. People still need stuff fixed. So what's going to happen is this labor pool is going to be a lot smaller. You're going to get a, you know, a few guys in there that are sharp, that know how to, that are kind of a jack of all trades or willing to learn. And, you know, they're willing to be a one man handyman band or, you know, build a, a team of six or 10 or 20 guys. And they're going to be able to basically name their price, right? Mm-hmm. Like a CPA is charging 250 bucks an hour and attorney's charging 350 bucks an hour. You watch, dude, handyman in the next five to 10 years are going to be charging close to those types of rates be- simply because there's going to be nobody else in the industry that can do it. Like they're just, they're not going to have enough labor to, to perform the work. Yep. Definitely. I, I would highly agree. And I think yeah. that's exactly what we've created here at the handyman journey. Uh, you know, we have courses, we do coaching, we have books that really help people become yeah. handyman and create their business and take it to the next level. So I think that's something that's definitely needed. I would highly agree with you. And really the educational system has gone the other way where they, they expect everyone to go to college, you know, and they don't really offer trade schools and, you know, um, yeah. certain classes like metal shop or auto shop or wood shop anymore. Um, but that's something that's going to be needed more in the future because they're just not being raised right now. So we are going to well, be in high yeah, demand. I mean, yeah, we could go down the, I mean, you're talking to a guy that's like, I did the college thing, right? I, I got an MBA and I'm, I'm a huge, huge proponent of education. I'm like, I'm so anti universities and colleges, mm-hmm. unless you're going to like specialize in something that requires mm-hmm. it. Dude, you're absolutely wasting your time. Yeah. You need, it's a, just, need a it's, specific goal and outcome. Yeah, exactly. Like if, <laughs> right. if you're going to be like a doctor or a lawyer, which you have to go to college, fine. But other than that, like if it, if it's not required in, in what you want to do, like in my opinion, you're absolutely wasting your time. Yeah. Most people that I've, I've talked to lately, younger kids, they're like, oh, I'm going to go to four-year college just to figure out what I want to do with my life. That's and I'm a, like, that's not the place to figure out what you want to do with your life right there, man. That's very expensive. <laughs> that's an expensive way to figure out what you want. You could, you could just go get a part-time job through the summer, like working for a handyman and then working for a plumber, like, and you'll actually get paid to learn and figure yeah. out what you want to do with your life. Like that's, yeah, right. that's a better thing yeah. to do. But again, it just boils down to the fact, dude, it's not sexy. It's not being sold on, no. you know, in schools and universities. So kids don't want anything to do with it, which I mean, I get it. Um, but mm-hmm. what, what th- there'll be a few kids that probably aren't the sharpest tool in the sh- shed when it comes to the classroom that are going to figure out, like, I'm going to make a lot more money than, than the dude next to me simply because I'm willing to do the work. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I mean, people, uh, I love the, I love the quote by Mike Rowe. It's like, you know, people that say, Oh, opportunity just never comes. Right. He says, no opportunity is always there. Sometimes it's just dressed in overalls and comes with a shovel. Like (laughs) you got to get dirty, you know what I mean? To figure out what you want to do. And that's what opportunity is. So, um, so, uh, as we kind of close here, uh, Nick, what kind of, uh, advice would you have for people that are looking to, either start up a handyman business or maybe are currently in their handyman business and kind of looking to for some help or knowledge to kind of help it get going. What kind of advice would you have for those people? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, there's a little bit of a loaded question because everybody's kind of in a different stage, but if I just had to give blanket advice, my advice would be um, make it easy for people to do business with you. And what I mean by that is, Make it easy to get an estimate or a quote. If you're gonna if you're gonna give estimates versus like time and material, just make it easy for them to get that. So, um, just so that in full disclosure, so the listeners know, like I've hired Jason to build out our handyman marketing piece. Right, it's very easy for people to hit our website and to request a quote, and then on the back end, build systems and processes that makes it very easy for them to get scheduled on your calendar and makes it very easy for them to pay. So, so what the way that the way that it works on our business that I've tried to just make it easy for people is they request a quote on the website from there. We very seldom do on-site assessments, but I'll just from pictures and their descriptions, I'll give them an estimate with that estimate. There's a deposit required. If they pay the deposit, that obviously bounces back to us. I see they paid the deposit. Then my team is to within the one business day is to reach out to that client and let them know when their when their job will start. And we've gotten to a point where we used to we we were able to just say, hey, you're going to start on 
Wednesday, the, the 22nd or whatever Wednesday is. Um, but we've gotten to the point now where we actually have to give ourselves a little butt for meaning like, Hey, your anticipated start date is Wednesday, the 22nd. That could fluctuate, give or take, you know, uh, five to seven business days. We'll, as it gets closer, we'll let you know a hard date. So, so once people have given us money immediately, they know, Hey, boom, we're scheduled and they're good to go. And then dude, show up when you say you're going to show up <laughs> and do what you say you're going to do. Like that's beautiful. It's that's very simple. Like, yeah. And then take care of customers concerns, right? Like mm -hmm. even if you think you're in the wrong, dude, sometimes it's better to say face, just fix it, yeah. lose a little bit of money pie. or <laughs> not make as much money and, and get a five-star Google review over it. So mm -hmm. Yep, but definitely. That would be my advice. Try to make it as easy as possible for people to do business with you. Beautiful. Mic drop right there. Well, uh, in closing here, Nick, we just want to say thank you so much for being on the Handyman Success yeah. podcast. Um, you have made it great today. You've uh, really inspired others. You've inspired me. So great job. And thank you so much for tuning in. We just really appreciate uh, having you here with us, Nick, today. So thank you so much. Hey, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, to all of our viewers and listeners out there, I just wanted to say thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, you guys are really what make this podcast worth it. Uh, you are the people that we want to inspire. You are the people that we want to raise up. You are the leaders of the next generation, and we appreciate you guys listening to this podcast, and hopefully you glean some information here. I want to give you guys a little bit of info of how you can contact us, how you can take it to the next level. Um, we do offer, you know, business coaching. We offer courses. We offer books. You can reach all of that as well as contact me and Jason over at handymanjourney.com. Uh, we also have a free ebook over there that we'd love to give you. Uh, you can also get plugged in with Jason and his uh, awesome marketing expertise over at handymanmarketingpros.com. Uh, if you guys are tuning in on YouTube here, uh, like this video and subscribe to this channel. That really helps other people see this video. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, we will catch you on the next video. These podcasts come out once a month, the first of every month. So uh, stay tuned for those and we will catch you guys on the next one. Have a great day, guys.